Hi, welcome to the Healing Trauma Podcast. My name is Mark McNear, and I will be your host today. I'm sitting in for my good friend, Monique Coven, and I am so honored today to be able to introduce you to a friend of mine, Sam Jolin. Sam, welcome to the Healing Trauma Podcast. Mark, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. You know, before we get going with this, I have a confession that I am a real researcher, and I have, I will tell the uh, listeners that I am so excited about your work with trauma. So sometimes I go overboard, so I, I put together like maybe, I don't know, 700, 800 questions that I needed to <laughs> I need to pull it in. So I put in my cards so that I wouldn't expand too much. You know, if you see me looking down at card jewel notes because I've contained some. some that's so of, great. That's amazing excitement. That's awesome. So, it, it gets me excited for our conversation. It's going to be a good and deep one. Yes, definitely. So may, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and who you are, who you are and, and the work that you're doing. Great. Yes. Um, so I'm a therapist by day. It's my day job. Um, I work with men, married couples, specifically with sexual trauma recovery victims as a therapist. I've been doing that 20 years. So uh, a good long season. I'm an author, a new author of a book, The Sex Talk You Never Got, a, a book to help men um, engage their story of sexual formation and um, their story of even places where they may hold sexual trauma. And I'm a lover, I say. I've been married to my wife for 21 years and a lover of Jesus um, and a lover of his good world. And I'm a father of three boys who are 13, almost 13, 10, and 7. And that all wonderful. keeps me very busy. That is just wonderful. So, so in, in um, going through your book, and I had the privilege of getting the book early, let me just hold it up for people to see. Mm. And I would just recommend this book. It is a book that helps you come alive from mm. sexual harm. And so I just want to thank you for writing it. And one of the endorsements that I saw that uh, I pulled off um, the internet was from Dr. Dan Allender. And, and Dan Allender has been on this program. He was on with Kathy Lorzell and Monique. You know, yes, right. Listen. Yeah, he, he, he wrote of your book and he says, as much as this is a phenomenal book on men's sexuality, it's a way of thinking and being as to what it means to be truly human. Sam really outly weaves the core realities of the human condition, desire, beauty, shame, trauma, and redemption into the perspective that will bring grief for what you have missed and glory for who you are and who you could become. Such a great endorsement. And I, I couldn't agree with him more in, in, in that about your book. So thank you. As we get into that, I kind of want to go to, um, an interesting thing that I read about you as far as COVID and, and, and the shed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, in my journey as a writer, I built a shed. I did it when my children were a little younger and I needed a place to write without having to, you know, just go to a Starbucks down the road and leave my wife at home. So I built a shed in the, in my backyard and as a, you know, a place to write thinking this is, you know, as every, well, at least me as a writer, thinking this isn't going to go anywhere, right? Uh, you, you never know where the writing life's going to take you. But it ended up being a place that I, uh, I already had a shed by the time COVID hit, which was wild that God had kind of written, written that in the story because sheds, you know, work from home sheds became a thing during COVID. And so it was a place that I ended up counseling remotely for a year. But it's also the place that I uh, formed the book proposal and started writing the book proposal and really, since we all had all this extra time sitting at home, sure. it, it pushed me into yes, this, this book needs to be written. Somebody needs to say something here uh, to help men engage their, their sexual formation differently, as well as, you know, the stories of trauma they hold. It became the place I wrote 95 cent of the sex talk you never got. And the beautiful part is I'm now sitting in a, in a office in my basement. It, it's actually an old utility closet turned office space. But my sons, I was able to give that shed to my sons as their their playhouse. Um, we actually call it their little fishing cabin now. That is yeah. Awesome. So that that was a a place God met me 
and helped shape these ideas um, and let me birth this book. So good. So good. So, so Sam, maybe you could tell us uh, how you got into this work, how, 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 it, how it came to be. Yeah. You know, um, it started, which is maybe true, um, I imagine, for most people who engage healing work, right? Whether that's as a therapist or a podcaster or a writer caring about the survivor community. It started for me by going to counseling. So I was 19 and I was, um, had interestingly gotten caught with, by my own, by my mother had discovered that I had been looking at pornography and graciously invited me out of that. Would you like to go see a counselor? I'd, in the middle of all that provided this opportunity to connect with a very kind counselor who I assumed was going to, you know, simply sit and berate me um, or, you know, give me the hard conversation um, about, um, you know, acting out with pornography. And instead, he ended up being a really, really kind man who just through his own curiosity, slowly invited me into my story. And I remember that first session even with him just ending in tears, talking about parts of my story that I had never talked about and thinking like, I literally said to him as I left, like, what did you just do? Like, how did we get here? Because I, I, I feel like I had been fairly shut down. I hadn't cried in a number of years. And there was something about his questions that just opened me back up. You know, that's really where this kind of awe for the magic of therapy occurred. And I remember thinking like, my goodness, if I could do that for a living, that would be amazing. And, you know, through a little bit of a journey from there, I eventually ended up getting a counseling degree in my 20s. And I've been loving this work ever since. But it started with you know, being, uh, doing my own story work and recognizing the wild goodness of engaging your trauma with kindness and your story with kindness. You talk in your book about men coming to see you. And, and I can so relate to this in my own story. Men come, coming to see you and starting to do story work. And, and they mentioned to you that, you know, many of the things that they're able to talk about with your help you know, they plan to take it to the grave for them. You know, yeah. Why is, it, why is it so hard for us to talk about these things? Yeah. You know, I think most of us don't hold our trauma as trauma, right? We don't think of it initially as trauma. We think of it, most often we hold our trauma as shame, right? Like, yeah. we must have screwed something up to make that harm happen. I find that is, um, it's rare for somebody to come in with kindness for their own pain. Most of the time it's buried in a sense of shame. Uh, I must have invited it, right? And even the way an abuser might script the harm is, well, you invited this, right? You, you wanted this or you pushed me to do this. You know, evil, I think, really hopes that we bury our pain in shame and silence. So most times when guys come in, they come in because something's falling apart in life or yeah. or they're falling apart internally or something's on fire, right? Uh, a relationship's ended or mm. they're stuck in some sort of struggle or some sort yeah. of addictive acting out behavior. And they want help stopping, right? Stopping the pain, stopping the struggle. And we slowly, you know, as was true of my therapist with me, we slowly start to unwind with curiosity how they got there. And as you noted, most guys, you know, will say they, they hold their trauma and especially their sexual trauma as the weird thing that happened that one time, right? They, don't, they aren't thinking, well, I was sexually abused. They're thinking, oh, there was some weird things that happened. And most often feeling, I must be perverted, or I must be dirty, or I must be twisted for what happened, right? That fact that that happened must mean something about me. So it's usually the weird thing, right, is the word they use. Or they'll say things like, I plan to never talk about this with anyone, or I plan to take it to my grave, 
because it feels so indicting of us. Uh, again, that evil seeks to blame you for your own pain so that you bury it and you shut those parts of you down and you don't live fully alive. You don't live with all your heart. You, you, you find a way maybe to function, but you, you might feel dead um, or shut down inside. That's so good. So good. Those words are so good. You talk about addictions, and, and I think that, you know, that idea that, you know, addictions are not really the problem. Yeah. They're a maladaptive solution. You know, Gad Ramati says, you know, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. Yeah, that's good. So, so I have seen in, in the work that I have done, and I want to ask you, you know, just addictive behaviors, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to cope. Yeah, you know, that, that. Gabramante quote is so well said. We don't stop to think about the pain, right? We we think of our own behavioral struggles. There's so many, especially as men, there's such a struggle with how to be kind to our stories, kind to what we suffered, you know, traumatic maybe in, in our story, but also simply even just the daily suffering of life. We're not good as men connecting with our bodies, right? Like if I'm sitting in a counseling session with a guy and I say, what's going on in your body? He'll often say, what? I'm fine. Right? Like there's not, or they'll look at me like, what are you asking? What do you mean? What's going on in my body? It's right. Boring. Like it's, ab it's absolutely foreign. You know? Right. Right. There's a yeah. sense of like, I'm getting through. That's what I need yeah. to do. Right. As a man, yeah. I'm, I'm shutting down my body yeah. so I can function or perform or get the job done, right? And I find that, you know, most men then struggle with how do they cope with, you know, daily stress or daily struggle of their problems, you know, just the tiredness of work or the, the, the traumatic pain that they're limping with. Right? And they'll often try to soothe with addiction. So, yeah. You know, what are the ways men most often soothe? Probably alcohol and pornography use, right? And we don't think of it as um, that body up. I'm actually trying to relax something inside of me. I'm actually trying to get some relief or comfort, soothing of my dysregulation. I'm trying to come down out of fight or flight. That I find that most often men are not acting out of, let's say, with pornography you know, just, just an overly active sex drive, they're, they're, they're trying to comfort something that needs soothing. Comfort the harm. Yeah, comfort the pain. Yeah. Comfort, again, whether it's just the daily moment of like, man, I had a stressed out day. Or those deeper layers of, I'm trying to keep something at bay. Right? I, I'm trying not to have to feel something of my own pain. That that's what they're... They're trying to soothe. And of course, it's not real soothing, right? Addiction, or, you know, it can be overeating. It could be anything, right? There's so many addictive things we can get stuck in or ways to dissociate sure. from our pain. But there are very few that actually connect us to our, our pain and help us actually heal it and get comfort in it. Yeah. So, Addictions so don't do that. No, 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 no. They, they do short term. Yes. <laughs> they just don't work out. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Alcohol is a very, very reliable vasodilator, meaning literally yes. it will relax your, 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 um, your blood vessels and you mm. will feel a sense of relaxation. But it's not healing. Right. It's not yes. restoration. It's temporary until the alcohol is gone. So... So if I can ask you, we're using, you know, this is the Healing Trauma Podcast, and, and I just want to stop for a minute and just kind of hold up Moni Coven because she has done so much work in this area and has made yes. it accessible to so many people. And, yes. you know, Sam, when I was in training, there was no talk about trauma, you know, in the mental health field. And, and so yeah. I'm really excited that the field has opened up and, and, and is coming up with ways to heal from trauma. But, you know, if we could go back to the basics, it seems like sometimes the word trauma is so overused 
And so I just wanted to zero in on that for a minute, if I can, with you and, and ask you, you know, in your work with people, how would you define trauma? Or how do you see it playing out in individuals' lives? Yeah. You know, trauma at its base, I think it's, I'm forgetting now, Greek or Latin for wound, mm -hmm. right? The word literally just means wound. You know, interestingly, the word vulnerable also has its roots in the word wound, mean able to be wounded. So there's something, you know, trauma is just a fancy word for being wounded. Um, and at some level, you know, I'm okay with the word becoming somewhat common. Right. I would rather have it be more common than less common, meaning mm -hmm. there's something you're right. Is it overused? Yes. And, uh, you know, are people naming things as traumatic that maybe aren't clinically, you know, in the definition of trauma? Yes. But there's something good about we're having a cultural conversation about trauma now and yes. that there's an understanding people can be wounded. But what's a wound, right? Well, it's when, and others have said this better than me, but, you know, I understand trauma as really a time when you are overwhelmed with felt experience that's negative and there is no source of love or care or comfort for you. Meaning it's not simply what's blood, guts, and gore on a page, right? It's not just the facts of what happened. Like, well, it's got to be really, you know, bloody and, and, and harmful on paper for it to count as trauma. Trauma is when you internally feel overwhelmed with negative felt experience and there is no one coming to comfort you um, or the absence of care and love. Um, you're suffering along with the pain. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. If I could ask you for some permission now to go into one of your stories that you had yeah. shared before. You know, I, I wrote down the plane and the panic. Yes. Yeah, that's a um, that's a good story in the sense of uh, just the journey it took me on. The story itself was not good. Yeah, when I was engaged to my wife, we were, we were on a plane flight with her family. So her brother was there, my brother-in-law, her parents we're in this plane and we, we, we took off from an airport in the middle of a thunderstorm um, in Florida. And the plane literally lightning flashing out the window and the, we hit some turbulence and the plane dropped. It felt like a hundred feet, right? Like, and then caught itself and everybody in the plane screamed. Um, and I went through a panic attack. Um, I had never had a panic attack that I knew of, but in that moment, I was overwhelmed with terror and could not soothe. Yeah. You know, the wild part is my brother-in-law, and so we, you know, the plane, the rest of the plane flight was okay, thank God, but I was not okay and spent a long season walking through, you know, a number of months beginning to engage that event, but even the impact you know, the parts of my own story that, that stirred in. And that might sound strange. Like what you, you went through turbulence on a plane and it connected to parts of your story. And again, in the symbolism of the heart, right? Things that don't feel connected connect. And there was some sense of being alone and terrified. Yeah. That opened this door into more of my story. The wild part is my brother-in-law literally put his hands up like he was riding a roller coaster during yeah. a plane flight. And, mm -hmm. you know, as I'm shaking, getting off the plane, he was saying like, "Woo, that was awesome. Like, wasn't that cool? So it, you know, it, it really holds this sense of like, you know, trauma is not just about the facts of what happened. It's also about the felt experience that you suffered. I mean, like for my brother-in-law, that was not traumatic. It was fun. Right. But for me, it rocked me and yeah. I had to go engage therapy and do some of my own story work of, around what did that symbolize, mm. you know, to be terrified and alone. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned story work or doing your own story work. And, and I have heard some podcasts with you where you talk about being a narrative therapist. You, joke, you joked around about being a non-invasive brain surgeon. Yes. 
It's a bit of hubris in that for yeah, me. It's, it's not, it helps you <laughs> understand, though, what that looks like to be a narrative therapist. Yes, you know, and apologies to every real brain surgeon out there who's doing that good work <laughs> and has gone through many, many more years of school than me. But, you know, therapy, obviously, at some level, we cannot change the facts of our story. I can't change the fact that that plane flight happened. No one can yeah. change, you know, the facts or the, the, the concrete reality of what's happened in your life. But, you know, is, then are we just left at the mercy of sorry? You know, hope it works out. No. The beautiful thing about the brain is that it's, it's malleable. It's plastic, as we say, right? And so yes. the, yeah. the meaning of your story can change. So what those facts mean is really where trauma holds us captive. It's not simply the facts of what happened, but what it means, right? And so, uh, in other words, it shapes what you feel about yourself, the meaning you hold about who you are, the meaning you hold about God or life or love or relationships or sexuality, as I talk a lot about in my book can all be shaped by the impact of your trauma and those facts. That's where we can change things. Because if you think about it, you know, those facts of what happened are stored in neurons in your brain. Neurons can be shaped, right? So you literally have, let's say, the memory of what happened when you were 12 stored in a set of neurons and dendrites. Yeah, yeah. And, and so... You can actually, when, when you are recalling traumatic memory, when you're feeling flooded or overwhelmed by past experience, it's because those neurons are firing in your brain. And if you, this was wild to me, we don't just remember what happened to us. We remember what it felt like the last time we talked about it. So literally, when you access traumatic memory and then talk about it you relive it a little bit right like you you aren't reading a script in your brain like of what happened you're you're actually seeing the tape or the pictures and feeling the sensations right um and then Absolutely. you're telling people what you're seeing in your head so if you think about it you re you have to relive it to talk about it you know it, it, a little bit yeah and, and and this is such exciting work because you know, the way you're explaining it for people, it, it, it just gives such hope. Yes. That we don't have to get stuck in our, yes. in our stories of harm. Right. Right. In other words, you can still get the love you didn't get in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that might sound crazy and um, wild, but if you tell your story with somebody who is kind to you, or you hold kindness for yourself as you're telling it, right? or you sit in the kindness of God to you, it can actually reshape the felt experience. Meaning again, that, that memory is relived, but now in the presence of kindness, and that imprints on the memory. Meaning you now have a felt experience of somebody being kind to you in the context of your pain, which I think is just such found reality and that's where i came up with you know being a non-invasive brain surgeon there is a so bit of in, in uh, that idea that people need hope yes you know that people have been beat down yes by the things have happened to them but change can can happen and things can get better yes yes every time you are brave to tell your story and risk opening your heart and that memory to somebody you have the chance for it to be rewritten, literally for the neural dendrite connections to be shaped differently, which is false. Now, sadly, again, you know, often victims of um, sexual abuse, you know, sometimes most will attempt to try to tell somebody about the abuse around the time of it happening. And often, you know, you know, how that goes will shape if they shut it down or not. Uh, meaning if, if somebody believes them and honors their pain, it can be just as impactful as the abuse itself. 
meaning for good. If somebody yeah. treats you with care and, and shows concern for your pain, that can be just as healing as the, the, the trauma itself. Now, again, it can be harmful too, meaning if somebody doesn't believe you. Um, I think this uh, statistic I heard one time is it's, it's about 10 years on average until an abuse victim, sexual abuse victim, will try again, trying to tell their story again. Yeah. And sometimes it's more than 10 years, sometimes decades. Yeah. Meaning like, if it doesn't go well when you try to get help, you might just shut that part of you down. Yeah. And not risk because the vulnerability is too painful. Yeah, it makes my job believably amazing. You know, that we get to sit with victims and be that place of kindness um, that they never had. And to be that place of kindness when they're not able to for themselves. Yes. Right. Right. Because again, most people don't come in saying, I have trauma and I want to be kind to it. Right. Most of us bury that and, and, and hold some form of self-hatred yeah. for ourselves, right? That we manage the shame with. You know, interestingly, I read a, a study, shame is experienced in the body just like trauma. Yeah. It mirrors traumatic memory in how it's felt in the body. So shame triggers in us fight or flight. You know, except, you, you know, you're not running from a bear. You're running from yourself. Which, you know, how do you do that? Well, the only way to do that is to turn on the part of you that you think got you in trouble. Yeah. So you turn to self-hatred. I'm going to shut down, you know, if you're somebody who suffered sexual abuse, as I talk about in my book, I'm going to shut down my sexuality. I'm, I'm not going to connect with it. I'm going to hate that part of me. Kind of, you know, I have seen this a lot with individuals where they kind of divorce themselves from their bodies. Yes. Right. You know, just separate themselves. Right. And we, and it's, it's weird to think, you might not think right away that's self-hatred, right? You might be like, you know, um, this, the kind of passive, I just don't care for myself. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I, but to begin to understand, there's actually maybe some revenge you're taking on your own body in that. There, there's actually some roots of self-hatred. So in coming to you, okay, and I'm going to share just a little bit of my story. I had uh, physical abuse, severe mm -hmm. sexual abuse. Not that all sexual abuse isn't severe, but it was you know, really intense stuff mm -hmm. and emotional abuse and, and uh, verbal abuse. And so when I enter into my story, yeah, you know, there is this regulation. You know, I'm either shut down or I am all over the place, you know, being hyper aroused. And what I found, and I want you to elaborate on this, is mm -hmm. when I could sit with people who could help me to regulate the front part of my brain came online. Yeah. And I could think clearly or more yeah. clearly at least yeah. to be able to form the words, to yeah. be able to share my story. I'm, I want to ask you, you know, what does that look like in your work? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that is to watch people start to risk on kindness again is unbelievably brave work. And so, you know, there, there is a sense of how do we help you dip your toe in the pain enough that you can go there, right? And you can start to talk about it. But we don't want you to just relive it and feel the trauma again. So there, there's a tension there, right? Of we need to go there enough that we can talk about it and we can open that part of you back up to care, but not in a way that leaves you feeling overwhelmed and just re-traumatized. And so there's a sense of inviting people when they come in. I mean, risking on kindness for an abuse victim, as you're naming, is so brave, right? Because everything, you know, it's, it's often in the context of, of or wanting love that we are, you know, is where we usually received those first wounds. 
It's when we reached out for love or it's in relationship with a caregiver. So, you know, there's a sense of it, 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 the, the goal here is not push yourself back into your trauma. Just go there, right? Because that is not inherently healing yeah. if it's not done with kindness. You're, uh, so it's inviting that space. It's just always holy, sacred ground when somebody risks on kindness. And that absolutely. might be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I will never tire of, of being, you know, in, in, on that sacred ground with people. So it's, it's, it's honoring, like that's brave, slow, maybe even at times work. Like you might be only able to dip a toe in your pain. You may be only able to give a headline. Meaning like even, you know, for some people just to be able to name, I was sexually abused is inherently brave. Yeah, it is. I, I, when you're talking about that, I'm thinking about it in like my, my own life. I had a therapist that was uh, trauma informed, really good. Uh, when I first got out of rehab and started my journey, and you know, one of the things he said to me was, I, I had such a hard time just even sharing little bits of my story, you know. And so we we came up with this idea that if it became too much for me, just for me to put my hand up. And to put the brakes on is wrong. Yeah. Talks about you know just to apply the brakes. Yeah, and to be like that's enough. Yeah, and it's so cool. Yeah, he was so honoring of that. And, yeah. and there were many days where I couldn't do a full session. Yeah, I would have to leave after twenty five minutes. Yeah, you know my hand would go up, and I'd be like enough for today. Yep. You know, until I could build the resilience. And I just want people to hear that. It's a slow process, but yeah. a very, very rewarding process. Yes. Yeah. You know, for, for there to be an understanding as well of you don't have to get through all of the stories to get healing. And you don't have to go through the story really fast and you only get the healing at the end. As you're naming so well, Mark, like those going to your story with kindness, even if it's for five minutes is redemptive and it will yeah. begin to heal you and you might yeah, feel like it actually it actually changes the brain like you yes. did it it earlier but it's slow it's tedious but so worthwhile so yes worthwhile. yes yes and changing you will begin to feel that different way of being with your own body and being with kindness kindness grows in you again you don't have to get through all the story to get that kindness and that healing. It happens even with little bits. Absolutely. Such good stuff. I just want people to hear that it can get better. You know, yes. Because I talk to some, so many people that are like, I don't want to open this can of worms because I don't want to feel worse than I already do. But it yeah. does get better. Yes. You know, I, I want to switch gears. This is so exciting. You know, the, the, this talk. You know, people who have been traumatized get smaller. Yeah. emotionally mm -hmm. you know need to come alive and one of the ways i believe you talk about in your book is learning to play well yeah you know yeah i got a, when i got a rehab i was like what, what are you talking about with this play stuff what is that you know, i can't sit with myself how do i yeah how do i play how do i enjoy my life I, i'd love for you to talk about that yeah you know um I think one of the hardest steps for survivors of abuse, any form of abuse or trauma, is to open themselves again to goodness or to hope. In many ways, I've found that survivors are really okay at some level. Sure, I can go to the pain. Yeah, I know how I, yeah, I've lived with the pain. And again, I'm not saying they can go there maybe kindly, fully, or, or in all the ways. But the idea of having to face their pain, like, They've got grit. They've suffered so much. So yeah. go to the pain. Okay. Right. And again, not easy, but an easier sell than now go welcome goodness in your life again. Go be open yeah. to love again. Go be open to the possibility of play or delight or desire or pleasure. Right. Those things are actually very scary 
to relax back into for survivors of abuse. So I do talk about play in the book as a place. You know, play has all kinds of impacts neurologically. Play is this unique place called a mixed state where it puts you in a little bit of fight or flight, but then returns you to soothing. Stephen Porg's um, in polyvagal theory talks about this, that there's actually this beautiful way, he calls it neural exercise, mm. that play no. allows us to touch a little bit of that fight or flight, but then to return to soothing. And so you actually hold, you actually feel both states, you know, sympathetic up, up rising and then parasympathetic soothing um, in play, meaning like, you know, it's intense at level, some level, right? You think of like a game of soccer, right? Or something, right? There's an intensity and we're competing, but then we're relaxing, yeah, right? And we're celebrating and we're hugging and there's like this comfort that returns or uh, there's the risk of play, but then there's the return to comfort and soothing that happens. That's this beautiful thing that play can do with us is there can return us to that childlike openness. Yeah, to life, you know, to pleasure, you know, even deeper than just neurologically, it can return you to younger parts of you that you, you know, were shut down. I, you know, I think of the men that say things like, gosh, I just never felt like I got to have a childhood. Yeah. I never got to have that, that childlike innocence. Play can connect you there and do its own healing work. So good. You know, what? one more question I have for you, and that is, you know, with people that you work with or with people who are around people, you know, I had to go on my own journey, but my wife had to, you mm-hmm. know, chose to, I, I should mm-hmm. say had to, but she chose to, mm-hmm. you know, go on the journey with me. You know, what, what, do you, what do you want people to know, you know, that have had abuse in their life, sexual abuse or other abuse, you know, what do you want them to take away? Yeah. You know, what do you want people who are with those people that tend to be so dysregulated at times? What do you want them to take away? Yeah. You know, probably the, the greatest thing I hope for um, is that you begin to turn the tables on your self-hatred and shame. That, um, again, maybe, I, I can't say this because I don't know every victim of abuse, but all of the people that I work with, at some level, battle shame and that their trauma gets stored as shame and that there's then this kind of deadness to hope, deadness to beauty, deadness to pleasure and sensuality and sexuality within that, deadness to life um, in play and that life becomes survival. I'm getting through and I'm doing whatever it takes to get there. And survival is a good thing. But you were made for life. So some sense of saying, I, I want to invite you to turn the tables on those places that have felt, you know, I just need to take this to my grave. You know, there is no hope for me. I'm a lost cause. Th- those kind of, what, what I would say, what evil hopes for most is just that you shut down and are stuck there. Um, and it's not easy work uh, by any means, but you you get life along the way. You get healing along the way. You don't have to do all the work to get the prize at the end, so to speak. Uh, I, I would want people to know and to begin to feel the whispers of maybe there's hope for me. Maybe there's more to the story um, than I've concluded. So, so I have about, like I mentioned, about 700 other questions, but we're going to have yes. We're going to have to do this again. So this is uh, you know, so refreshing. I, I want to share this with you. Um, my nervous system is not real calm at times. Mm. And I notice when I enter into different relationships, what my body does. And, and because I had so much harm from a male, mm. very interesting for me to monitor that. Mm-hmm. You know, and we set up, uh, I want to share with the listeners, we set up a phone conversation, you know, yes. and it was, I just want to share this with you that, and I want people to hear this, entering into that phone conversation with you, 
beginning to be very nerve wracking just to be like, what is this going to be? Yeah. But then feeling my body just relax as I talk mm. to you, you know, mm. noticing your kindness, yeah. your grace, just as a person. And I, and I just wanted to share that with you. Ah, that, thank you, Mark. Yeah, I think you are doing really beautiful work. And I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. Yes. Go ahead. Well, and Mark, I just want to say, I love how you have blessed the witness of your body. That you've come to trust your body and its intuition and helping you uh, go through the world and go through relationships. It speaks so highly to the work you've done that you've recovered and blessed the witness, right? The voice of your body and you've come to trust it. Well done. That's Thank you. a statement of good work. Um, I'm going to take that with me today, okay? Take good. That, that kindness. Let me, let me ask you, if somebody wants to uh, connect with you, how could they contact you? Yeah, um, my website's probably the best place, jolman.com. And um, I also have a Substack stack um, newsletter or place, publication where I write more on sexual wholeness and trauma recovery. And I'd love to find you there. You can find that link at my website, or you can go search for me on Substack. Those would be the best places to get a hold of me. So, and if somebody wants to purchase your book, yeah, the book is out in the world as we speak. You know, go where where you love to purchase your books: it's Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Bookshop dot org, or Audible. There's an audio book version. I was, I was going to say, I noticed it's on Audible too, which is so good for people. So many people have had trauma. Some yes. have had a hard time trading and reading. And yes. so I think that's awesome that that's being offered. Yeah, and I got to read it, which was like wildly exciting for me. So I uh, would love to meet you there too. Sam, thank you. Thank you for joining me today on the Healing Trauma Podcast. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a great pleasure.